What's up, what's up, what's up, everybody? You're listening to the Data is My Science podcast, show to make data your passion. I am your host, Dapper Data. Okay, look, we've talked about supervised learning. We talked about unsupervised learning. We talked about deep, deep learning. We brought people on the host, right? You know that we brought people on the, we brought people on the show that really talks about, um, they, they might not even be data scientists, right? They might not understand what uh file systems are right you know or or transport of data is right or ssl right you know we just brought people on but we've helped them understand what data is truly about okay and so you know i know the audience out there it ranges from novice to advanced but i want to introduce you all to somebody right his name is bo button say hello bo hello everybody all right bo so 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 he is really interested in something that we have never, never at one time talked about on this audience, on this show, right? You know, the audience is going to be introduced to something new, or if you do understand this, you may really, really enjoy this topic, right? 3D printing, especially in the gaming industry. Now, from my understanding, doing a little bit of research, right? 3D printing gaming equipment can easily provide replacement pieces that break down, you know, with all the button mashing, all the rough housing you need out there and stuff like that. This is why gamers are putting up designs, right, for replaceable arcade stick buttons out there. So all you kids, all you people who are adults who love gaming, we're going to dive into something that could possibly be a career for you in the future, you know, and, I, and I'm and i really excited about this because I have kids, right? I have kids that game all day. And at one point, I said, man, these kids out here, all they do is game. They don't go outside all day. They don't do any of this stuff, right, like we used to do back in the day, Bo. But, uh, but, 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 but this is actually something that could become a career for them, right, in the game industry. And I've started to adapt to it a lot more. So without further introduction, without further ado, I want to introduce you all to Bo Button. Now, Bo has been actively involved in software development, I mean, since the age of 11 years old. And it might have been before that because I felt like you said something about nine, right? You yeah, know, I, learning computers or not. I got into hardware around eight, but I didn't fully appreciate, you know, the software aspect of it until around that uh -huh. in like teenage years. Okay, okay. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you now, to me, that's like a savant, right? You know, <laughs> somebody that, like, how in the world, maybe it's just exposure, maybe that's key because I have introduced my son to, uh, to, to, to Python programming at the age of like five, six years old. And he's like good at it right now, right? And and so I sit there and I look back, I'm like, man, why was why didn't I know this, right? But maybe it's about exposure. I mean, you look at like the Mark Zuckerbergs, you look at uh, you look at um, Steve Jobs, right? You know, they're in the garage, they're like all that stuff. And, and they were fully exposed, right, to that, you know? But you got an early start in learning computers at age of nine, digging into hardware side of things. Right. And we talked about that a little bit. Uh, when I look at hardware, I was like, man, I started off software development, which got me into understanding everything else. It helped me understand everything else. And I'm going to be honest, you're the first person that I heard that said, man, I started hardware and I was able to really expand my knowledge into the software industry. So that lets me know that uh, it's not about maybe the way software developers think versus hardware developer things is probably all about like what you really want to do. Right. If you're, if you're interested in knowledge and learning, yeah, well, then you're going to get it right. The, the truth about how I got into computers is way less sophisticated than that. I grew up uh -huh. in New Orleans. It was hot. It was humid. And as a young male, uh, I mean, I think we always, and maybe it's not just unique to men, but like this, idea of automation and control, being able mm. to tell a machine. And, and the reason I bring up the weather and where I lived is the alternative to being inside and poking around with the hardware that people had given me. I've always had a knack for electronics. I've always done like remote control cars, airplanes, whatever I could get my hands on. Any Christmas, I would always ask for something that was an electronic device. So when nice. I first saw a personal computer and I first received like some pieces of an old uh, IBM, probably PS2, like 386. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, well, I can probably take my knowledge about basic electronics and apply it to hardware. But like my, my options were go outside and play hide and go seek in 100% humidity or stay inside. 
All and right. that's how I got into computers. It, it, there is no like my dad did. My dad was a pipe fitter, like on the polar opposite end of the spectrum. He was yeah. <laughs> more than gas companies, like doing things that, quite frankly, I still to this day don't quite understand. But that was the motivation to get. Now, I, I had an appreciation for it. So it wasn't 100 percent sheer laziness and the, the desire to remain cool. But mm -hmm. I think most engineers at the end of the day, at least the ones that I've worked with that are extremely talented and, and be, are able to get things working the way that we want, ultimately share one common trait. We're lazy. I don't want, <laughs> I, I want, I want to be able to do a lot all at once. Yeah. Like, yeah. To be quite frank, my baseline laziness is most people's accelerated kind of like, this is my max. Uh, I'm yeah. not trying yeah. to like toot my own horn, but like I've got friends and family that I'm just like, you could be doing a whole lot more like, oh, I'm so stressed. I don't know anybody. I'm just like, oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like how did, how can you automate, you know, what you're doing? Right. You know, like that, that that's that's exactly the way that I feel, because a lot of times we sit there and it's all these manual tasks you're doing all the time. Right. You know, I'm like, how how in the hell can I just make this automated so I can uh, it's almost like buying back your time. You know, you just want to oh, make yes. sure that you don't. Uh, that you don't waste time, right? I hate wasting time. I'm no, always absolutely. like, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Like, if it's something that you need to do multiple times and it's reasonably reproducible, and, mm -hmm. and obviously, like, you know, cutting the grass, this is a, a great analogy that for the longest mm -hmm. I never thought that I'd have a solution to. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't invent the solution, but like, I saw a company advertising a robotic lawnmower in Austin, Texas, where I live, and it was a mm -hmm. subscription service. And I'm thinking, OK, well, now I don't have to spend two, three hours a month and it's only one hundred and forty nine dollars a month. And I've got this Roomba like automatic robot. That yeah. kind of progress. My first like reaction was it's going to drive itself into the pool or it's going to run right. away from the dogs. Obviously, I put safeguards in place to make sure that it didn't murder any of our pets. But right. my surprise, this thing is constantly cutting my grass 24 seven. So like those kind of things that most people well, might have. I need that, man. Oh, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. It's it, or right now because the grass is not growing. It's dormant. It's on pause. But like right. it's made by a very large company called Husqvarna. It's called the Auto Ro uh, Auto Robot Auto Mower or something like that. It's clever. But this business in Austin saw an opportunity to create a subscription model around it. So like that came that same kind of thought process. I've applied to everything. If it's if it's a digital process, you better believe I'm going to write something so I don't have to do it multiple times. But like mm -hmm. time is precious. We have a limited amount of time. And Man. if we can become extremely efficient in everything that we do, um, obviously we can enjoy more of our own time. My goal now is to have more free time. I find Man. myself getting to a point where my brain's just like at the end of the work week, just like it's swollen. I mean, I've already got a massive cranium just because of genetics. But like <laughs> there's like this energy and whatever the hell else. It's probably just, I don't know, some type of cortisol bowl at the end of the week. Yeah. I just it first. So like just sitting around and doing nothing or reading something is is really what I'm trying to get more of or to, to, mm -hmm. to have more free mm -hmm. time to do. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, what you're doing is amazing. You know, it's I it's I enjoy connecting with somebody that thinks just like me, right? You know, the whole automation piece is amazing to me. You know, and having spent the majority of your career right as a serial, serial entrepreneur, you know, you've been working in government space. You know, you transitioned over to the mobile gaming space. And now you're the CTO, right, of a company called Atlas Re Reality, right? You know, you want to make sure that you are, that's still, you're getting into that gaming industry, right? You're diving into that. And it's amazing to me, right, Bo? I mean, you know, you become this tech technology and automation specialist, of course, through experience and exposure. You haven't been, you haven't cared. You have not cared about, it seems like one of the most amazing gifts Right with people like you and me, that you just have not cared about failing, right? Oh you no, jumped into so many things. That's you know? the thing, and I, I joke like I did this like ancestry.com test to determine like where my ancestors came from. Mm -hmm. My last name is obviously Button, and like I grew up thinking that like you know in the movies like if it was like medieval times like your last name was indicative of like your family's profession or something. I'm like, mm -hmm. heaven forbid, my family all they did was make buttons, but I can assure you genetically. <laughs> I don't give up. 
Like there's really, there's no such thing as a deterrent. I mean, there are things mm -hmm. that might slow you down cognitively and be like, ooh, this is gonna be hard. But like, yeah. that's one characteristic or trait about myself that I'm most proud of is this, I'm not afraid to try something. I'm not gonna just like rattle off overconfidently. I can do that. It's like, I'm not afraid to try. And I think mm -hmm. 95, probably even greater percent of the time, I'm successful in that. It may take like two, three weeks, months, who knows? Right. You know, don't be afraid to try these things. I mean, yeah. tech can be, you know, intimidating. Uh, you had mentioned like the intersection of 3D printing and like gaming. You know, we don't do, obviously we build mobile games. There's not really an opportunity for like 3D printing, but like mm. people with disabilities that need specialized controllers or someone like myself who is an avid collector of old hardware, old gaming hardware. If you mm. need to replace a component on an NES Joy-Con or a pad or something like that, you may not have an opportunity to go buy something like that from Amazon. So, you know, mm. I'm not afraid to get into any of those. Now, it is also somewhat detrimental because I I've gotten into so many things and spent so much money on each one of these individual hobbies. And so sometimes you just, you know, you get it gets old. But uh, I'm right, not afraid right. to try anything. Like, literally, I know how to sew. I grew up, my mom taught me how to sew. Nice. So my daughter's clothes rip for school. She's like, Dad, can you sew this? That doesn't, like, some, some of my friends feel like it's like, why are you sewing? I'm like, why am I not? Why aren't you sewing? Like, right, exactly. You know? Exactly. No, no, no. I mean, failure, I never look at it as failure, right? I always look at it as a, uh, um, a lesson. It's a lesson. Right? Look, when I hire, I'm always hiring for somebody with experience. And some people think that experience is, well, I've done a good job for the last five years. You know where experience is gained is in failure, in a mm -hmm. war zone. All right. So mm -hmm. what I'm looking for is somebody who's been in a war zone, who's already in tune with war zone like mechanics. So when we are right. like, and I'm not talking about real warfare, like managing cloud servers, sometimes of the day feels like war, like it, you're fighting yeah. a machine. But like, I don't want somebody who's just lived this happy go lucky life at a corporation and never experienced any of these like pitfalls of dealing with like highly technical like architecture. So, I mean, it's like, it just you, you can't be afraid. I'm not afraid. There are certain things I am afraid of, like Australian insects. That right. Oh, that's a. I don't even. I've never been to Australia, but I heard that they're. I, I do not want to deal with the insects. I, look, I, really, <laughs> I am afraid of Australia because of the internet. Like I don't want to see a. <laughs> I'm not interested. But like, if it's something that's intangible, a digital thing. I'm all mm -hmm. in. It doesn't matter. As long as it makes sense and there's like a purpose. I'm not going to do it just because somebody tells me I should do it. If I feel like it's going to enrich me and I'm going to learn something, like I, I keep all of that. That's like a database of just knowledge. So like even my 15 year old. So you mentioned you have kids. I have a 15 year old, a 13 year old and a 10 year old. It's like, how do you know mm -hmm. how to do this and that and this and that? I'm like, I've done it. I wasn't afraid. Or in some instances, as a young man, I didn't have the money to pay somebody to come fix the plumbing. I'm going right. to figure it out myself. And now here I am, right. you know, a software engineer who's capable of sweating copper pipe. Like, who? Yep. The <laughs> no, absolutely, man. You know, so I want to dive bro, into uh, Atlas, Atlas reality, right? Like that is... Um, it's something to be said about that, right? You know, in the gaming industry and you think about 3D uh, modeling and things like that, you know, you all talk about merging interaction between digital and the physical world, right? You know, I mean, when I hear that, I think metaverse automatically, right? I think I think those type of things, right? And so- um, to, to, <laughs> You're not wrong. If you're looking at the industry, what you just described is gonna be- Exactly. That metaverse category. That's exactly what I see. I'm, I'm, you know, if I was the re the website, bam, that's what it says, right? And, and so I'm thinking that automatically. Can you explain a little bit about what Atlas Reality is, right? You know, what you all are doing and how you're helping um, improve the world. Absolutely. I mean, there is most definitely a, a social factor to what we're doing. Um, at, at our core, we're nothing more than a mobile video game development company who specializes in location-based games. So think, mm -hmm. you know, Ingress, uh, Pokemon Go, et, et cetera, where you're using real-world maps to navigate and collect things on a map and do things that are, you know, for lack of a better expression, like geofence. Like you can't do mm -hmm. that unless you're physically there. Um, we started the company as a consultancy. Uh, it was previously called uh, Cerberus Interactive, and we were building just regular mobile games for other companies. And after about a year of business, we said, you know what? This is not as fun as most people think. It's certainly not fun yeah. from our experience. Let's build our own game. And it was right around that time that Pokemon Go launched. And 
I looked at what my experience was in the government space. We had done a lot of GIS, so like geospatial stuff. And mm -hmm. my business partner, Sami, had done a lot of user acquisition stuff in the fintech space. And we we're like, you know what? Let's build a game that is a location-based game. And the genre we chose was uh, the closest would be basically tower defense slash strategy. So we looked at like Clash of Clans, which is still wildly mm -hmm. popular today and successful. So we built our first game, Atlas Empires. That's still alive. It's still in the app store. It's still doing well. But for the last year or so, we've been working on something called Atlas Earth. This is what you're mm -hmm. you know, putting into that, that metaverse play. Um, just to be clear, my definition of the metaverse is simply the evolution of the internet. It has nothing to do with this. Now, the core takeaway is like what's essential in this next evolution of the internet? Level mm -hmm. one web was knowledge. Web two was social people. Web three mm -hmm. is ownership. So in addition mm. to having an evolution of the internet, which may very well be largely 3D or somewhat 3D and 3D headsets, virtual reality, et cetera, is as a consumer, as, as a video game player, as a, a Facebook you know, user, a social media user, you want to share in some of this wealth. Like read the stories about how much money is being generated from ads and how they're controlling your habits. Mm -hmm. As a consumer, myself and as a technologist on the opposite side of this who has an opportunity to make an impact on this i want people to have skin in the game and mm -hmm. that's the social good that we're doing behind atlas earth um if you read the internet like our business model largely is it's confusing to people because quite frankly we're not allowed legally to talk about how it works because otherwise we'd be considered a financial product instead of a game mm -hmm. So we're not FDIC insured. It's not a checking account. It's not an investment. It's a game. But what we do is we allow players to buy virtual real estate and that virtual real estate accrues virtual rent in the form of cash. And that cash, once it reaches a $5 threshold, can be cashed out as of today, only available on PayPal. Um, to date, we've cashed out a little over, I think, $250,000. So like of mm -hmm. our 1.5 million uh, players, $250,000 has left our ecosystem and gone into their bank accounts, which is unheard of. No one else can say that they've done that. I mean, there's right. there's incentivized, but that's really what we're doing is we're trying to build a platform that allows people to, to A, establish some type of you know passive income by playing something that's entertaining. Are we there yet? By all means, no. We've got a lot of work to do, but we've got a, a, about 1.5 million users. So we're doing something, right? Um, and it's, it's a really active community. Man, where do, where do I sign up, man? I want, I want some passive income. Right look, there. if you've got a, a mobile phone, hopefully it's not a flip phone. If you have a flip phone, <laughs> I'm not working on that version. But uh, just go to the Google Play Store or Apple App Store and search for Atlas Earth, and you'll see, you know, you'll actually probably, if you just type in Atlas Earth, you'll see Atlas Earth and Atlas Reality's second game, the Atlas Empires game. But, yeah, that's the best way to get it. Or you can just go to www.atlasearth.com, and there's two uh, call to actions in the middle of the page that links you directly to the app to install it. Man, I, I didn't I didn't know that there was some uh, that part. Right. You know, because it reminds me of. So when you get your cash, when you get your money out. Right. Are we or is that similar to like a Bitcoin or something like that? No, that's I mean, the, the biggest thing. So uh, oftentimes people uh, they struggle with decoupling the metaverse and the blockchain. So yeah. like, I understand why, because everybody and their grandma who brings up Web3, they think Web3 is the blockchain. Um, mm -hmm. I'm convinced from my experience and where I want to see it go. So I'm, I'm, I'm emitting that energy is Web3 does not require the blockchain. But what we get from the blockchain is that equitable component where you can own something. Now, yes, the blockchain does uh, make, uh, let's say, proving that you own something very straightforward because it's public. You, you know, you can say, hey, look here, I own this NFT because I control the private key for the wallet that is assigned right. that NFT or that owns that NFT. But the problem with Web3 and blockchain is right now there's a very high barrier to entry. The first time user experience is garbage. It's getting better. And I'm very I'm, I'm looking forward to the next two to three years because ultimately we will probably use that in our games. But we are not on blockchain or on the chain and we do mm. not leverage cryptocurrency. So when when I say you, you earn cash, it's fiat USD. OK, OK, man, I need that. I need Look, that it's, it's not for everybody <laughs> right now. It's a grind. Um, yeah, we're we're slowly but surely introducing things. We we've had a lot of obstacles. Our growth was off the charts. I mean, we we got the product 
we launched and ultimately we realized that the architecture of the product wasn't going to support the load. We struggled with our architecture, third party vendor architectures. But again, we, we haven't given up. We aren't going to give up. Um, right. And it's evidence then what we're able to do. I mean, if you go to the Facebook group, you'll have everybody and their grandma talking about this and that. And some people aren't right. happy, but look, I'm here. I'm on Facebook. But yeah, it's it's I, I suggest you install it. Wrap your head around how it works and, you know, keep up to date with our in game or on the roadmap on the website, because we've got some really cool things coming that I think is obviously going to increase the uh, uh, the attractiveness to a, a much broader audience. Right now, the, our, our primary audience is grinding, playing the game. They watch ads. They, there's incentivized video rewards. So you watch ads, you get uh. currency, et cetera. So again, you're not going to like put down the Xbox remote and stop playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare just to play. <laughs> but you might play Atlas Earth at the same time because you just, you know, passively play the game. And it's, it's a yeah. Um Yeah. There was a game called uh, Venture Capitalist that Mm -hmm. I'm kind of impervious to games. Like I don't get addicted. I love simulator games. I love those types of like, I just want to get in there and have like an open world and do my own thing. I don't want somebody telling me, Hey, this is what you have to do. But there was right. a game, venture capitalist that you installed it. You basically, you could run lemonade stands, which like when I say it out loud now, I'm like, why in the hell was this entertaining? <laughs> but what you saw at the top of the screen was your revenue. And there were things that, ah. you could do. So that business minded bow button was like, oh, this is fun. Let me see how good I am at running a business. But it was really mm -hmm. a game. Similar thing here is like this is a game. But at the end of the day, if you play your cards right and you act smart, you can actually increase what you're generating per second. And that's real money. This is not some number that's in the database that you'll never be able to spend. This is real cash. Right. Now, that's amazing. That's amazing, man. So I want to dive into 3D printing a little bit. Right. You know, because uh you know a lot of people don't understand that. a lot of people don't know it right you know i mean if you're tech you're growing with tech that's great you know you may probably well like understand it uh even in the game industry right to be specific right it's a whole different realm right that's that's diving deeper uh and when we look at 3d printing right allowing you to design and scale uh down those retro machines or like arcade games to to suit like your environment right you know 3d printing models um they, it seemed like they've been able to give you arcade sticks, right? And massive buttons, right? On 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 a on a compact toy that you have, right? I don't know, right? And and so it seems pretty cool that that stuff has is is, is evolving. Um, so how how do you believe the influence of three D printing on the game gaming industry is at the moment? I mean, look, like I said. <sighs> There's a lot of applications in gaming for so 3D printing is additive manufacturing. It's you know the the analogy I like to use like when I described it to my mom was a hot glue gun. You yeah. pull the trigger, the glue is extruded. Now imagine yeah. you did that in one layer and you kept doing that, but every time that you did it, you moved the gun up a quarter of an inch. Ah, and layers right. and layers and layers. Now that's just one method of 3D printing. There's a bunch of other mind-blowing new ways of using lasers and stereolithography, which mm. it's incredible. But for, for, for the average person, that's kind of an easy way to describe how 3D printing works. You've got a 3D representation of something in the computer. There's a piece of software that's called a slicer that takes that 3D model and slices it into layers. And then all the 3D printer does is move the printhead in the XYZ you know, kind of configuration and extrude the filament and the filament is nothing more than molten plastic so instead of being molten glue it's molten plastic that it it it, it, it dries or uh, you know cools almost instantly but in regards to where i see its application disabilities i know this is mm. it's not everybody but like you can you can go buy replacement joysticks for an old legacy arcade on ebay there's chinese companies there's asian companies that will send you an entire box of excess buttons for like nine dollars but there is a movement of folks who are building their own arcade cabinets who are designing the buttons or downloading the pre-designed components and then printing them in their house and customizing them and doing whatever they want. But that's just mm. one use. I don't think that's going to like pick up. I don't think that's like, like the future. I think it's cool. And it's certainly something I'm interested in. You know, mm. I would gladly spend $10 on a $1 button if I can make it myself. It's not an economic <laughs> That's just how it is. But mm. 
when it comes to disabilities, you know, Microsoft, I can't remember the name of their controller, forgive me, but they came up with an incredible controller for folks that have mobility issues and hand configuration issues because you can't, maybe you can't hold the controller properly, but like yeah. being able to create custom devices that allow other players with disabilities to interact with the gaming systems that we enjoy without disabilities, I think is probably the most prolific use of 3D printing in gaming. Um, the only other area that I've seen 3D printing and gaming kind of intersect is board games, where you want to mm. print like figurines, or if you've got an idea for a board game, this actually, it blows my mind. I came across somebody, I think it was at the Consumer Electronics Show, all they do is create board games. And, you know, instead of having injection, injection molded plastic pieces that cost, you know, $25,000 for the mold, he designed the actual 3D models in Blender printed them himself and, and manufactured a, a small run of his board game. He printed the board, he did everything himself. And I'm like, you didn't have to involve a third party at all. You did it mm -hmm. all in your house. And yeah, I mean, does it look like the commercialized version of Monopoly? No, but would I buy a game that was 3D printed that no one else had that I thought was fun? Yes, I would, I absolutely would. Man, no, that's amazing. That's an amazing idea that a person created. Do you find it, um, like even being like a creative challenge to reinvent arcade games like during through 3d printing i mean i haven't seen that intersection really at all like there hasn't been a lot of 3d printing influencing any i mean people print figurines like if you're a mario fanatic or a donkey kong fanatic and you've got a 3d mm -hmm. printer you can print a stationary model of that but I haven't seen 3D printing influencing gaming. It's 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 kind of a an augmentation. I mean, it's ah, again, right. An influencing, I think, would be the wrong word here. But I mean, look, they they certainly go well together, especially in the arcade space, like you were saying, with components and printing pieces. Um, right. If you've heard of, I'm sure you have the Raspberry Pi. I've seen a lot of people mm -hmm. print these little Raspberry Pi cases that look like Super Nintendos. They're really small. I thought oh, that. Man. Um, I didn't buy one because I've got about 12 <laughs> other cases that I don't need or don't use. So I was like, you know what? I just need to hold off. But like, yeah, I, I don't see 3D printing influencing games. I, I think 3D printing is a tool that can be leveraged for building board games. Like obviously for mobile games, like in my space, I don't see any intersection at all. Um, now, what ah. is, is the assets that we use, the 3D assets that we use in our game, um, I'll actually, I'm going to reach over here and I'm going to grab something. Uh, this is a crystal hammer from Atlas Earth. Oh. This is 3D printed. Now you can't really see from a distance because it's uh, the zoom level here, but this was something that we took out of the game. It was something that players collect. If they played the game and they saw this, they would instantly know that, oh, that's an Atlas Earth crystal hammer. And oh. we had printed, this is actually half scale. We printed much larger versions of this for a oh, an investor party. We gave each of our employees one of these. If I would have created or if I would have contracted somebody to create these custom using an injection mold, then they would have probably cost me five, six thousand dollars. The what? cost and the material and time for this was about twenty-five dollars. I mean, that's that's night and day. Plus, yeah. I had a person in Austin, Texas do this for me, and I just picked him up from his house. That's it. Very simple. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, look, oh. there, there's certainly a lot of applications, but I don't think it's gonna actually replace or you know, like maybe it somehow in the future influences it, but I think it's really going to be video games are influencing 3D printing, not necessarily in the technology, but like how we're using it, what we're using it for, um, and then the disability side of it. When I saw that, you know, the Microsoft controller, and then I started looking at what some of the open source community was doing for building customized gaming interfaces for folks with specific disabilities. Not everybody obviously has the same disability. So if you've got a, you know, an amputated arm or something, it, like, you can design it in 3D uh, using something like Fusion and then print it and, and trial it. And if it doesn't work, you throw it away and you're out a couple of dollars rather than, you know, spending $20,000 on some type of prosthesis. Yeah. And I've seen like a zombie apocalypse game. Like it was a game that was out there that was, that I thought was uh, at one point pretty cool. That was like 3D printed, and um, and and like some other game. I forgot the name of it. Like Micro Planter, like a chess set, right? You know, uh, and it, it was it was pretty cool. Uh, so, uh, like like I wanted I wanted to really dive into. I want the audience to. I mean, the, the especially the ones that are out there that are really interested in 3D printing or interested in gaming. Um, 
um, or just 3D printing in general, right? You know, in your opinion, right? There's many tools out there. There's many ways to do 3D models for printing. If you were to sit there and say, look, what are my top three and why as far as 3D printing software, um, what would you choose, right? You got like tink Tinkercard, you got Onshape, right? You know, what would what, yeah. what, what, what be your choices? They're all hard. Um, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, so my, my choice, I don't do a lot of 3D like geometry modeling. I just, mm -hmm. it's my brain is not that type of brain. Mm -hmm. If I do need to do something that's 3D, I use something called OpenSCAD, S C A D. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's what they call parametric modeling. And, and what that means is as a software engineer, I have, a, 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 let's say, a, 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 a desire to, to write code to do things. And mm -hmm. like opening up a, a program and having to learn its interface just to get a sphere on the screen can be challenging for someone like myself. So what, what SCAD does, OpenSCAD's a free version, is you actually mm -hmm. express your 3D model as code. So instead of doing mm -hmm. it interactively with the tools, if you want a sphere, you type the word sphere. And just like a function in a program like Python, you yeah. give it arguments and then you can have variables. So if you oh. want to have a model that allows you to create, let's say a metric nut, you can have a variable, which is the inner diameter. And then if you mm -hmm. want, you know, a 15 millimeter versus a 17 millimeter, that's not two separate models. That's one model with a variable. So then in the code, I just change one variable and magically it generates a 17 millimeter hex nut. Um, wow. that, that's my preferred way. And again, I'm, I'm more often than not, I'm printing things that are mechanical in nature. So this applies or it, it lends itself very well to printing things that are mechanical, like components. Oh. If, you're, if you're an engineering type of person, if someone said use OpenSCAD to build a 3D replica of, uh, you know, a, a model of a person, I wouldn't even know where to begin. So you know, oh. if you think about primitive geometry and like what I'm using 3D printing for to build mm -hmm. functional things, Open SCAD, um, and there's other versions of SCAD. Um, to be honest with you, I can't even remember what the acronym stands for, but if you just Google SCAD, I'm sure it'll be the first response that comes up. But again, it's parametric modeling. Um, secondly, like designing is the first phase. You have to have something that's either designed already, you can use Thingiverse, and there's a, a laundry list of other websites that let you download free 3D models that are designed or prepared for printing. The second thing is you need to slice it. Like I mentioned earlier in that analogy with a hot glue gun, uh, my preferred slicer is, is called Simplify 3D. Um, mm -hmm. It's not free. There is, I think, a trial, but I've had the most success with this application. The other one that I would like, I put it kind of in alignment with Simplify 3D is called Cura 3D. Um, Cura is also a, a very well-respected one. Again, there's so many levers and so many things. Like if you install it, you don't have a 3D printer, your, your head's going to explode. There's just so many toggles and you may not even know what half of them, probably two thirds of them are. Um, and honestly, that's really the only type of software when it comes to 3D printing that I'm dealing with is the design and then the slicing. When it comes to the 3D printers, there are, I mean, uh, like we were talking about hardware, these 3D printers run firmware. They run software that control the XYZ mm -hmm. axis, et cetera. There's a company out there that creates a controller called Duet, D-U-E-T. Um, mm. I don't recall what the name of the software is that runs on it, but I would lump it together. It's like a software slash hardware combination. But those controllers I've seen a lot. I've had a lot of success with, you know, you can buy a cheap 3D printer that comes, you know, straight from China with no instructions. You can get it for one hundred dollars. And as long as it has mm. the right stepper motors, you can take one of these duet controllers and enable it with Wi-Fi printing, like so many features mm. that I never thought I would have ever seen. So. Those are the three things in the 3D printing space that I personally use and I find, you know, are very, very productive to use. No, thank you for that, Bo, because I, I truly believe the audience would uh, be able to have a place to start, right? A foundation to think about uh, when you're when you're thinking about 3D printing. Um, you know, as the audience know, I like to end with what I call a dope nugget in summary of everything. And what I've learned today is that it really depends. When you're making a judgment call, this is probably anything um in the it industry and in life and business whatever it is but specifically if we're focusing on even 3d printing it depends and uh as far as choosing the tool and it depends on the domain itself right like what you are really 
trying to go after. I mean, that, that, like, I think that that was amazing what you said. I, I'm a data scientist and I sit there and I say, I could be a data scientist, it's a broad thing, right? You know, but I really couldn't be a data scientist in the financial industry because I don't really know about the finance side of things. And so uh, I, I'm really focused in on specifics when it comes down to being a data scientist, right? That's just my domain that I really love. I'm, 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 I'm really focused on. And when you're choosing a 3D printing, right? You're trying to choose the right tool. It seems like understanding the domain is important, right? And ease of use, because I know you mentioned something. Uh, I would think ease of use is a thing, but it seems like all of them are pretty difficult to use, no matter the domain, no matter what the tool Even is. The simple ones, like I, I yeah. open them up like SketchUp, and I'm like, all right, where do I start? But yeah, I mean, look, there's a barrier to entry for all of those. There's certainly ones that are easier than others, but like if you mm -hmm. jump straight into a CAD program, oh my God, you're gonna get sick really fast. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, is there anything you want to leave the audience with? I mean, like I said earlier, perseverance, like don't give up. Uh, mm -hmm. I started early. I obviously have an advantage, a competitive head start. But, you know, people ask me, like, are you forcing your children to get into this space? No, I'm not. I'm letting them become their own. But, like, one thing I am forcing them to really learn and live by is don't quit. Do yeah. not. Do not. That's yeah, it. Yeah, no. I like that. I like that. I like that, man. Uh, definitely have to enforce that in the new generation. For some reason, that new generation, uh, they lack it, right? It's like we gained it. I don't know if I was given it by anybody, but I feel like uh, you have to teach it, right? I don't even know how you could teach it. I feel like um, like one of my one of my uh, children, you know, he is very very smart, very sharp man, very great athlete, things like that. Uh, and he and teaching that go getter mentality right? You know, it's like, or teaching aggression, right? You can't see aggression in sports. It's like, you just have to have it, right? You have to have it, you know, so. What I've learned is I can't teach the things that I want to teach the most. What I can do and what uh -huh. I'm hoping for is I just have to live it and then hope mm -hmm. that the children see that in me. Like when daddy doesn't give up, you know, and look, there've been plenty of times mm -hmm. where I have a foul mouth. I'm like, oh, I'm yelling at this or that, like something's not yeah. going my way, but Rest assured, it's going to get done. I, I'm just optimistic that that's contagious. And they see that. Ah. When they're in that situation, instead of me just like drilling them with all these facts and like, oh, you can't give up. It's like, you know what? My dad wouldn't have given up. I'm going to keep hmm. pushing forward. That's all I can do. I, I, I Like I said, children are baffling, man. Like I've always yeah. learned <laughs> that I've got three of them. But hmm. I learned really early on, like, let them become who they're going to become. Lead by example, and if you make a mistake, admit that you've made made a mistake, and answer all their questions, regardless of how hard they are. I love it. I love it, Bo. All right, so now time for the fun part, right? I like to dive into a game that I call overrated, underrated. This is where I give the guests a series of topics, and you get to decide whether you think it's overrated, underrated, or right where it needs to be. You can explain that a little if you want, or we can keep moving. All right, you ready for the game? I'm ready, sir. All right, live music. Oh, this is bad. Overrated. Overrated? Oh, I man. Really I would have thought you would have said underrated, man. <laughs> I, look, I grew up, maybe it's because I don't like crowds, but I like high fidelity audio. And most of the concerts I've gone to, I have drunk people, I smell vomit, and I have a uh, really crappy system. I'd rather sit experience. in a listening room with high fidelity audio than be in uh -huh. a live venue. Okay, okay, okay. I, I could see that, you know, through experience, experiences, uh, you might have some bad experiences, man. For some reason, I like the atmosphere of that live music, uh, but I could see it's been certain places where the live music was not appealing, you know. Look, if it's um, New Orleans on Frenchman and I'm listening to blues and I've got a glass of whiskey and a cigar, <laughs> I'm all about it. Yeah, one of yeah. The concerts I went to was corn. And I, I mean, growing up, like, I loved heavy metal. That was mm. one of the worst experiences of my life. <laughs> I was like, I don't care if they pay me to go to their concert. I'm never going to one of those again. <laughs> All right. The Super Bowl. Way overrated. Uh, <laughs> I, I agree. I, agree. Sports. I cannot stand competitive sports. I told you, I like, <laughs> I, I'm an oddball. My, my fiance is the car enthusiast, the sport enthusiast. I can, uh, if, I were, if I was going to your house for the actual Super Bowl party, I'm going there for the food. Not yeah. the Super Bowl, but yeah. overrated. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people like the food, the commercials and things like that, right? They're I like halftime shows. I forgot about the commercials. I love the commercials. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. I, mean, I think the Super Bowl, at one point, it was great, right, back in the day. And then now it's kind of like commercialized. You know, it's, it's, it's just it's not really what it used to be, you know, There's in my so, opinion. Oh, it's so overproduced. It's like, like yeah. the, maybe it was the, the year before last, like the halftime show. I thought it was great because it was a lot of artists that I grew up listening to, but they all looked like animatronics at Chuck E. Cheese. Like, <laughs> like nothing was natural. I'm like, this is, I can see it. I know other people can see it. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Uh, you're. Are you out in Texas right now? I am, yes, sir. Okay. I don't know if you've been here before. Hill Country. I think it's underrated. Hill ah. Country. Look, let me tell you, I, I grew up thinking Texas was flat with like oil pumps on the side of the highway with like uh -huh. tumbleweed. Uh -huh. I, I moved to Austin, Texas, and uh, over here uh, by Lake Travis, which is kind of Hill Country. I didn't realize Texas had that. It's beautiful. Uh -huh. It's almost like the Hollywood Hills. Uh, I, I think it's underrated. There's a lot of places you can go. There's vineyards. There's a lot of things that you can do. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I have to definitely check that out. I I've been to Texas before. I'm trying to think, I've been to Austin. I don't know. You know, I don't. I can't remember. I've traveled so many places, it man. Does, I, it doesn't feel like Texas. Let me tell you, it's a very uh -huh. unique little place, and that's why I'm I'm comfortable here. Coming from New Orleans with that soul, Austin has mm -hmm. a similar vibe to it. Okay. Okay. All right. Next one. Oysters. Uh, five years ago, I would have said they're underrated. Um, I no longer eat animal products. So this is a, ah. today, the bow button of 2023 is like they're overrated. I don't want to touch them. But growing up in the You're South, a vegan, right? I am. I'm a diehard Great. vegan. Yeah. But, but for a very long time, 30 something years, I would eat anything that didn't eat me first. And look, mm -hmm. char broiled oysters from a restaurant in New Orleans called Drago's will, will blow your mind. Um, uh -huh. But raw oysters growing up when I was a teenager, I thought were disgusting. But then I started to appreciate the salinity and I had different types of oysters from different mm. regions. So like they are amazing. But in this day, I do not eat them. So I will say they're probably uh, in the middle. I, I, for the right folks, where they need to be for food, the folks. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and being a vegan uh, initially for those people out there that want to really try that you know i mean because some people just think of it as man this is just uh i'm, I'm gonna try it i'm gonna do it right you know they don't understand the lifestyle or what it is you know do you uh how how did you just make that transition say look i'm cutting it off today it's good to go it wasn't or, cold turkey it wasn't okay I went vegetarian first um there was a a, a life-changing event or an eye-opening event that kind of inspired me to like you know take a, a to look at what they were for what they were, which are animals instead of food. I grew up thinking of those as food, but something happened and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna back away from the actual animal, the flesh, and I was doing eggs and meat, so lacto and ovo. And then mm -hmm. after about six months of that, I said, you know what? I've eaten so much cheese and egg and milk, I don't mm -hmm. wanna see it ever again. So yeah. almost overnight, I mean, literally, I said, you know what, I'm cutting it out. I cook so it was easier for me because I took it as a challenge growing up, you know, with Southern cooking, jambalaya, gumbo. Yeah. You know, like I, I was like, you know what? This is a fun thing for me. So let me see what I can substitute. So in the previous when you asked me about oysters today, my favorite thing to do is cook oyster mushrooms, which they, they look ah. like oysters. But I eat a lot of fungi. I eat a lot of mushrooms, et cetera. But, um, yeah, it wasn't an overnight process, and it's not for the faint of heart. It does require a it's lot of but I live in Austin where there's probably about 40 brick and mortar and food trucks that are full on vegan. So if I want oh. like on Monday, I told my fiance, I would like a slice of pizza that has some type of cheese on it. It doesn't have to be dairy cheese, obviously, because I don't need it. So there's a place called Big Known. As I sat down, it's full on vegan. Everything's made in house. One of the best slices of New York style pizza you'll have. Most people wouldn't even know that it's not, you know, full on mozzarella cheese. It's house made cashew cheese. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, that's amazing. You know, for all those who want to go out to Austin, I for me, um, I tried like doing vegetarian. Right. You know, and then I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to try vegan. Right. You know, I've gone pescatarian. I've, I've made those different transitions. Uh, and, and for me, it was all about like that discipline. You know, it's, it's so to me, it was it was more difficult than what people say. Right. I'm like, they don't talk about the process. Right. They're like, oh, you know, for me. I was like, man, I got to eat, you know, but you have to realize you have to really meal prep. You got to really understand how to do those things because I'm not gonna lie. it was man. the hardest thing that I've ever done 
but haven't done it and haven't, haven't treated it like a religion. Not, I'm not a vegan activist. You won't see me at the chicken farm. You won't out there. Right. <laughs> I'm not that guy. Um, I did it for a multitude of reasons. First and foremost, it was indeed for my psychological, my conscience. Like my animals are, are creatures. They have, you know, beans, et cetera. But, you know, it was the most difficult thing that I did ever, ever in my mm -hmm. life. And it has made doing other things easier because now I can look back on what I had to do to like, prepare myself. And if I find myself facing a difficult situation or something I want to give up on, I just think about, I did this. I know yeah. I have to do this because it was, it was difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, last thing. Well, last two flowers. Oh, under I love flowers. I, uh -huh. I lavenders. I mean, I don't know if lavender. It's a flower, right? But the fragrance of, of lavender, the peonies, which my fiance loves, I always buy her. Uh, I grow. I don't grow a lot of flowers now. I grew up in a house where my mom was like she had a green thumb, like she grew everything. But mm -hmm. I love flowers, so I I see a lot of them. So I don't know if they're underrated. I think a lot of people appreciate them, but I, I'd like to see more of them because they, they they are calming. Not just aesthetically, right. but like the fragrances that they bring. I love just natural fragrances. So let's let's go with underrated. Underrated, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, you know, Valentine's Day coming up. I thought I'd bring that up to see uh, <laughs> what's your thoughts. <laughs> flowers, and there's a florist out here in Cedar Park, Texas, that they always get my business, and they do an amazing job. But when those things start to dry and they start to release those oils. The whole mm -hmm. house, especially if you have flowers when it's kind of warm in the house, like in the cold season when the heat mm -hmm. is on, it activates those oils. I love it. Oh, man. Oh, man. All right. Last one. Bitcoin. Overrated. Over. I can't. I don't know how to say overrated <laughs> enough, loud enough, large enough. I don't. It's the <laughs> most overrated thing on planet Earth. Hey man, I I I I am I absolutely agree with you because at one point I was like, man, what's this thing, right? Once you educate yourself on it and and all that stuff, you know, I started to educate myself more and more. And and honestly, it took me actually being exposed to it, actually diving into it and trying to invest into it, you know, and understanding those wells, right? Those big wells and how they control uh well, control look, it. The the, the manipulation it's not unique to cryptocurrency markets. That that mm -hmm. same manipulation occurs in the everyday stock market. So if, mm. if, if people are concerned about whales, they shouldn't invest in anything. That yeah, right. <laughs> just it. And just, just to be clear, Bitcoin is legitimate. It's a legitimate mm -hmm. technology. It's a legitimate you know instrument. I do think it's here to stay. But it's not for everybody. It's like people just they thought just like there was this wave of people who got into foreign foreign exchanges, like currency mm -hmm. exchanges, like Forex, like overnight, like half of my friends on Facebook that I thought were like super intelligent were like, oh, click this link, sign up for my Forex account. I'm like, oh, All right. God, please stop. <laughs> but um, <laughs> there's no such thing as easy money. Nothing easy is good. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's mm -hmm. just it. Look. I would love to win the lottery, and I've had this conversation with my fiance. I would instantly pay off everybody I know who's close to me their debt, and then I would mm -hmm. release the rest, the rest of the money into Goodwood. It, there's man, that's it. I just it said the same go. thing to my buddies. I was like, it man, to everybody go. close to me, pay off the debt, pay off put them the in debt. a better position. Exactly. Everybody's in a better position. Level it man. so we can all just breathe, and then do do goodwill. I mean, like dog rescues, like humanitarian efforts. I mean. I wouldn't even buy an exotic car. I'm, I'm I'm well on my way. In the next five years, if I don't have the car of my dreams, I've screwed up badly. But like mm -hmm. that kind of money, like I just I don't want things that come easy. I'm not saying everything needs to be hard. Look, I'd like a few things to like to be less difficult. But yeah. from my experience, if you don't grind and work hard and commit yourself to something, it's really not worth having. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely, Bo. All right, look, you have been an amazing guest. I appreciate you being on the podcast. I mean, this has been exciting. This has been fun, man. I loved it to death. Thank you for being on here. Thank you, uh, I definitely want to give you your flowers. You are doing some amazing things in the world, you know, and then, you know, and, and the stuff that's, that's, that's more to come, right? You know, a, a lot of things that we talked about, uh, you introduced us to a new, more exciting industry, right? Focusing on 3D printing, collaborating that with, with, uh, with the gaming industry, right? You know, and uh, it's been exciting, right? It's been knowledgeable. So I appreciate you being on here. Uh, so where can they reach you at, Bo? And is there anything that you are promoting right now? 
I mean, atlasearth.com, if you want to learn more about what Atlas Reality is producing, if you'd like to listen to more of my rants, uh, some of them are diabolical. You can just add me on LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> P-A-U-B-U-T-T-O-N. I do talk a lot of uh, stuff about uh, cryptocurrencies and Web3 and where I see the industry going. Um, and I think I have the authority to do so because I'm in the industry, at least in the play to earn and kind of like this movement where we have ownership in what we do on the internet. But yeah, LinkedIn and and just atlasearth.com. All right, great, great. Thanks, Bo. I appreciate it. Thank Audience, you. you know, uh, you can follow me on any one of the social media platforms at Mr. Data that's at percent sign, uh, Mr. M R Dapper D A P P E R Data D A T A. Um, and definitely follow the link on the in the bio. And and look, I love you all. Peace until next time.